Hi, I'm Jason Bellamy, and coming to you from CSM 2018, it's day two, and we're gonna keep doing these broadcasts from Facebook Live, and this morning I'm joined by Stephen George. Good morning. Thank you for being here, so let's, let's jump back. First of all, behind you, there's a Choose PT banner related to APA's opioid awareness campaign. Obviously, that epidemic has been going on and receiving a lot of focus for a few years now. In June 2016, at the next conference, you were the Maley lecturer and you talked about chronic pain. Um, chronic pain is obviously linked to, I'm going to just say, part of the opioid crisis because there's certainly a multifaceted issue. Um, so first of all, I guess let's just talk about the lecture and super briefly, if you can give me what you thought was like the one minute takeaway that you wanted PTs to have from that lecture in terms of understanding chronic pain, what was that at that time, kind of June 2016? June 2016, yeah. I need to think back, but right. it's actually a good question. I had a few people um, the other night uh, talk to me about it and um, what everyone seems to remember from that lecture is the tattoo analogy. Right. Um, so, you know, we had a good discussion about that and coincidentally, you know, this is the city where that actually <laughs> idea started and, and um, the Maddie was working in New Orleans so um, he doesn't work here anymore but you know I think the main message was really if that analogy has helped people understand um, some of the the variability that is going to happen and if it is in, in like a standard procedure like getting a tattoo if there's such incredible variability just starting to get an appreciation of what that variability is like when it's related to clinical pathologies and you know beliefs and context um, and I think that is the the one message and you know really questioning is that aligned with what I learned about pain how I teach you know students about pain how I educate patients about pain and how I treat for pain and I, so that you know that is kind of my I guess in a nutshell is the, the appreciating the variability and then what does that mean across those different domains and the tattoo analogy for people who didn't see the lecture was basically the getting a tattoo can be a painful experience right but when you go into it as first of all expecting some amount of pain and secondly based around a mindset that's positive this is something you want to do right uh, you're expecting it it's related around a positive event that sensation of pain is interpreted totally differently right. as potentially something lower level that might be associated around a negative event. Did I summarize that? Or correctly? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think you know what struck me as as someone who um, a lot of my research is in the psychological, emotional aspects of pain is the the tattoo artist had gotten to the same conclusion with very different methods, but um, that you know the the needle remains the same, but what the person brings to that, and if it's if it's a sad tattoo, you know, sometimes those are more painful. If it's a happy celebratory tattoo, um, people may not even describe it as pain, um, but it's the same stimulus. Right. And that's obviously a reduction, in, like that's a reduced way to look at it, but um, it, it really helps, I think, people to understand just how um, complex and how variable the system is. It's inherently a noisy system, and, um, you know, I think we're in an era now where people are pushing back on that system being a simple one um, and starting to understand that it, it, it could, if we do it right, it's probably going to radically change the way we deliver care for pain. Yeah. So that was June 2016. We're now February 2018. Um, describe, as you've talked to people about chronic pain and especially physical therapists being involved in management of chronic pain, how has the understanding shifted? How's the conversation shifted? Certainly the opioid epidemic is there. The need is as great as ever. Um, right. Kind of describe to me what's, what you've experienced uh, in your view going for the past year and a half or so. Great, yeah. And obviously my view is uh, you know just one view, but um, I think from one of the things that has been nice to see and it was all coincidental with the timing, but you know since the Maley lecture, there have been some very high impact practice guidelines that aren't driven by physical therapists that have really um, validated the role of early physical therapy in pain management, um, especially non-pharmacological pain management. And I think, um, you know, there's a c couple ways to perceive that, but I, I think it's very interesting that that conclusion came from outside of the profession, and it really wasn't driven by kind of the classic evidence. I mean, it was really driven by um, an opioid crisis and the first time pain was being linked to mortality uh, and the fact that physical therapy is seen as a solution um, is really um, empowering um, so I, that is definitely a shift and I think that is really what is driving um, in my mind the other thing is there's just people are hyper aware of 
wanting to seek information on pain. You know, you can see the programming. Um, you know, I, um, I think some of the organizers told me there were, you know, 20 plus sessions that were submitted on, on pain, which was, you know, a big jump from, from past years. So that's been encouraging to see. Um, and I think instead of the, the question being does, you know, is this the right way to go? It's really shifting to, you know, what are the best ways to deliver the early care? Um, you know, what are the non-pharmacological methods and approaches that we should really hone in on and use? Um, and I think it's changed the way we think about the evidence base. You know, I think uh, hopefully PTs are a little less worried about some of the nuances like, you know, the difference between uh, non-pharmacal treatment A and B and thinking more just about um, the timing of this matters a lot um, and exposing people to these um, opportunities to modulate pain without drugs and especially narcotics um, really becomes our primary role um, when you talk about pain management. So before we end this conversation, I want to talk about what PTs should be prepared to do uh, to kind of be aware and, and, and uh, about what's happening now and what's going to happen. But before, tell me about what you've been working on lately. Sure. Um, you know, since the lecture and, and trying to be a leader in this area. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've been working on is um, refining some of the ways that we predict outcomes. Um, that we've had some work supported by the orthopedic session section that has kind of come to ripening and we're starting to report some of that data um, and hopefully that will lead to some decision support tools for predicting outcomes. I, I really think PTs are going to have a predictive role like is this person going to be able to be managed with um, you know lower intensive options? Is this person at higher risk for escalating their care? I um, also have been fortunate enough to receive a large award from the NIH um, and there was a big call for the NIH combined with the VA and the DOD to look at um, improving non-pharmacological care for um, back pain and uh, we were lucky enough to put in a proposal that was funded and these are uh, large scale projects, they're six year projects and we're really looking at two different care pathways for veterans to get access, early access to non-pharmacological uh, treatments that most likely will be delivered by physical therapist and seeing if that prevents you know, opioid use and then results in better um, outcomes. And so we're in the planning phase for that and um, it's part of a new team for me at Duke University and at the Durham VA and, and um, so that's on the front of our reign and I think Professionally, it's very exciting. There are two other PTs, Dan Roan and Julie Fritz, who are PIs on projects, and um, I think only a total of five or six were awarded nationally. Um, so it was good representation and you know, further proof that uh, physical therapists have been active in this area clinically and scientifically, and, and I hope will continue to um, pave the way for what these future care pathways are going to look like. To do all the things you're talking about, you've been uh, I know, and I, I only know some of them, but you've been engaged in conversations that obviously go beyond the physical therapy profession, right? Correct. So you're talking to, to all these people who are trying to find collaborative approaches, recognizing that that has to be part of the solution. Yes. How have you watched the attitudes change of people outside the profession? I'm not just talking about data and what the data shows, right. but the attitudes within the healthcare system about the need for change. Is that is that changing? Is it changing fast enough? What have you observed? Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, I think it definitely is changing. Like I said, it, it's not a question of if or it's more a question of how are we going to change things so that, you know, physical therapists are seeing people earlier. And, you know, I think I tend to work in collaborative circles. So I think, um, you know, I work um, with chiropractors and I think there's when you when you focus on the solutions to chronic pain, it encourages group solutions that diminish some of the, the traditional provider roles. And I think the thought on the street is there's enough chronic pain that, you know, we probably can work together across multiple disciplines for the betterment of society um, in this highly prevalent condition. So I think, you know, there's going to be care models that, you know, we are working with what maybe 10 years ago would have been considered a competitor. <laughs> Um, and I think that's okay, by the way, <laughs> and uh, I, I may be right or wrong with that, but um, I think for this condition, for the need of it, um, you know, working together is going to be the way to go because it's such a broad scope. There's not one provider type.
that can handle you know the volume and do it in a way that optimizes the outcomes and you know because really it's it's the patients that we're working for so yeah and that was the takeaway APTA recently uh, conducted a panel discussion beyond opioids you can find that on APTA's website at apta.org slash beyond opioids and that was really the takeaway is um, you need this collaborative approach you need the mental health aspect of it you need Definitely. the physical aspect of it um, and on and on and on and, and that seems to be where patients are getting the best results it, um, and so I think that's the future speaking of that future then so for physical therapists who obviously have always been mindful about trying to get people beyond pain. I mean, that's kind of the old idea, right? right? Get back to function, improve your function, have less pain. Um, is, is the status quo enough, basically? What, what, should a, what should a physical therapist be doing now to prepare for, for this, the demand that's coming as we shift away from pharmacological approaches right. for the demand and, and what might be in the future? What, what, what's your advice for them in terms of what they should be doing now and next steps? Yeah, I think, um, from my perspective, I think, and, and I, I, I hit on some of this in the Mailey lecture, and it, some of it's semantics, but I think some of it's philosophy, is, is moving from that treatment mindset to management mindset and understanding that you know the person is seeking care for this episode and what can I do for this episode, but then thinking much more broadly beyond that episode, um, what are things that I can do to encourage self-management, um, what are community resources you know, that they may need to um, sustain improvements they've had in physical therapy. So I think of it more of a, a management perspective instead of you know, the, the cure perspective where I, my job is to cure this person in eight sessions over four weeks of their condition because we know most pain conditions are recurrent. They're um, going to be, when you have them, they're, you know, they're going to occur again later on. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our treatment options right now don't drastically change that long trajectory. So I think we need to be honest with that and think about our role. And it also changed the way we measure, make sure we're measuring the dimen different dimensions of pain that allow us to have meaningful conversations with the mental health profession, um, professionals that may be involved. So, you know, it's, I think some of these are gonna be um, large changes in, in the practice. And for me, it's, it's getting away from some of the detail that probably wasn't as helpful as we thought it was going to be 20 years ago. You know, some of the um, physical impairment, you know, the, not that those should be completely diminished, but the entire focus can't be on that. It has to be a whole person perspective. And it has to be, what can I do for them today, but also what do I want them to have access to? And what do I want to keep them away from over the next 12 months? So, what, you know, with the opioid epidemic as the backdrop, I look at this and I say, on the one hand, change is painfully slow, right? Nice pun, um, nice pun. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the change is pain, painfully slow in terms of uh, how dire the need is for change. And yet, at the same time, it seems like pretty rapid change considering that uh, how often healthcare, assistant, healthcare providers have been so in their silos and are starting right. to break out of those silos. So I realize, I'm gonna ask you to play fortune teller, and, and to some degree, I know that's unfair because <laughs> uh, what happens depends on what insurance companies will pay for, right. how accessible it is, all that sort of stuff. Um, but five years from now, there, there's how different you want us to be. How different do you think we will be in terms of how we manage pain as a society, as a healthcare system? What, what's your best guess? Well, I think um, what's, what's nice is it's, it's a high, priority high attention issues so we whether you know the amount of change that we have I, I hope is substantial enough I'm gonna dodge this question a little that, bit that's fair <laughs> that <clears throat> some of the key indicators of opioid misuse are being mitigated <clears throat> excuse me and some of those can be attributed back to our practice patterns changing um, how those specific pa practice patterns changing I think you know there's some broad sweeping initiatives that I've mentioned um, and, and, you know, it will change the way physical therapists interact with the patient, but hopefully it's in a way that is aligned with informing that pathway, like you said, getting out of that silo. Like understanding probably our most valuable role we play is not to communicate to another physical therapist about what this patient needs, but to communicate to the system about what this patient needs. And instead of instead of encoding that information in a language that only we can understand, use the tools that let us communicate to the system 
this person I think is going to do fine with self-management and here's the reasons why. So we, you know, we need low visits for this person. This person I'm concerned is not going to have a good outcome and is at high risk for escalating their care. And I think that escalation of care is going to put them at risk for longer term problems down the road. So, you know, I think if that's the type of change in five years, and to me that's a management mindset instead of I'm going to fix this person and you know and they're going to be fine the rest of their life. I mean that was that's a nice aspirational goal, but I think those are the types of messages that have inadvertently caused the opioid crisis because um, it kind of the message is we can fix this and we can fix it relatively quickly and easily. Well said. Chronic pain by necessity, one of the things that's being talked about here at CSM. For Stephen George, I'm Jason Bellamy. I'll catch you later. Thank you.